Good afternoon. I am so glad to be here in person for the Toronto Global Forum 2021 and excited to be part of what I think is an important conversation about building resilience. On behalf of Desjardins, a big thank you to the Honourable Perrin Beattie for moderating the event today. It truly is an honour for me. And to our accomplished speakers, Rasha Katabi, Bruno Colmont and Alifia Dorawala. Over the last 18 months, we've all faced our share of challenges at home, in the workplace, and in our broader communities. Many of us have already come to expect a little adversity in our lives as parents, as children of elderly dependents, as business owners, or as active members of our community. But what shocked many last year was how the economic and political impacts of the pandemic in one country or in one industry could affect us in another country or industry altogether. Think back to the endless news cycles about vaccine developments and availability. Who was going to get what and when? About supply chains for consumer goods, skyrocketing lumber prices, the impacts on housing or about the global tourism industry, the domino-like impact to workers when the service industry essentially shut down. As business leaders, we keep our fingers on the pulse of the global economy, but the heartbeat of that system over those 18 months showed an irregularity, an arrhythmia, that raised questions about the vulnerabilities, equality in the system, and yes, the resilience of not one, but multiple interconnected and dependent systems. At Desjardins, one of the things we've learned in 120 years as a cooperative is that collaboration is essential and we are better together. No one government or business or educational system can solve all of our problems. We need diversification in the system. We need concerted action from all parties. Internationally, through government agreements, public-private partnerships, and business frameworks. And nationally, from grassroots movements to industry-wide initiatives. It's about ensuring we're ready to come out of this pandemic stronger and ready for the next major shock to the world economy. We've all been affected. Supply chains still aren't going back to pre-COVID stability. Many of the global population are still unvaccinated. And climate events are more common and more real for more people every year. We need to work together and have a collective response. And partnerships, coalitions, and agreements that can implement science-based solutions that are measurable and will keep us accountable. Whether it's to tackle ch climate change, keeping us healthy, addressing labour force issues, or the inequalities we are seeing in society. A collective response that includes government. In Canada, we saw swift action from the federal government at the beginning of the pandemic to provide some stability and ease the concerns of many. A response that includes business Financial institutions are well capitalized, credible and stable. By the nature of what we do, we understand what our clients want and what our communities need. Financial institutions around the world are in an excellent position to invest in infrastructure and in companies that will foster a robust recovery and facilitate a green transition going forward. The global community has built international political and business frameworks to support our economies and strengthen our shared social and political values. Let's use that goodwill and strength of our diversity.
and all the technology that's available to us today and that's on the cusp of innovation to build a stronger consensus and more resilience for an increasingly interconnected world. It is now my great pleasure to introduce our moderator for today's exciting discussion on building resilience in the global economy. The Honourable Perrin Beattie is the President and Chief Executive Officer of the 200,000 member Canadian Chamber of Commerce, Canada's largest and most representative national business association. Before that, Perrin was the President and CEO of Canadian Manufacturers and Exports. In 2018, he was made an Officer of the Order of Canada for his lifetime of public service and for his devotion to the development of our nation as a community leader and corporate visionary. And you're probably blushing. But that really is just the tip of the iceberg of all that he's accomplished. Perrin, Thank you for being with all of us today. I will now hand it over to you to guide this exciting and informative conversation with our distinguished panelists. Well, Marilyn, thank you very much for that very kind introduction and for setting the stage for us. A friend of mine recently completed writing a book uh, about the experience that he's had in a long career in business as a management consultant and as an executive, the single, most the single most important criterion that he cited for successful business leaders was resiliency. And that's a, that's a factor that has been tested very severely both in Canada and around the world over the course of the last few years. Even before the pandemic struck, we saw that there were pressures on the global trading system as a result of protectionism. And we've been living for over 20 months with the global pandemic, which has put enormous strains on our societies and on our economies. And even as we start to pull back out of that, what we will be finding is that the recovery will be uneven, that we could see new waves of the pandemic, and that there will be further strains on the system with further crises in the future. So it's appropriate for us to take stock and to ask ourselves, what is it we can do within our businesses, within our national economies, and within the global economy to build in resiliency to ensure that we are prepared for the challenges of the future, including the challenges of climate change? We have a very distinguished panel with us today. We, um, we're taking social distancing very seriously, so they are scattered around the world and not in the room with me today, but, uh, but I think this will work very well. Let me give you the very short condensed version of their biographies to give you a sense of, of their backgrounds. If I were to uh, give you a, a full sense of their accomplishments, we would burn up all the time that was available to us because they're extraordinary. Alifia Doriwala is the managing director and partner at Rock Creek, a leading global investment management firm that applies data-driven technology and innovation to investing. Bruno Calmo is the head of private banking at De Groof, uh, at De Groof Peter Can, the largest private investment bank in Belgium. He's also a university professor and a member of the Royal Academy of Belgium. Rasha Katabi is the founder and CEO of Brim Financial, a fintech company that's based here in Toronto that aims to bring innovation to the credit card and financial space via its, sta via its state of the art credit card infrastructure and digital platform. Well, colleagues, welcome. Looking forward to, to this discussion. Alifia, why don't, we start, why don't we start with you? But I'd put the same question to each of you. From your perspective, what is it that, that needs to be done to shore up resiliency around the globe, in our own country? And what is it that, that your company can do to make a contribution? No, thank you for the question. You know, we think that building a resilient economy really means investing in our communities. And that means investing in healthcare, investing in education, investing in housing, and really understanding that um, many of our partners, the endowments, the foundations that we manage uh, capital for are doing all of this work in a very different context than what their investments are necessarily doing. 
So what we really try to do at Rock Creek is marry the two. What are foundations and endowments doing on their grant making side, on their program side? What are the amazing work that they're doing in the communities that we can then bring into the investment portfolio, all while generating the market returns that obviously all of the endowment portfolios need to be able to continue the work. So one of the things that we've really focused on in terms of um, you know, building a resilient economy is trying to see and identify where are the gaps why are we having all of these widening inequality gaps within communities? And how do we take an approach to inclusive investing that again is generating market rate returns, but is really making a difference in communities that we can then translate on a global um, basis. So, so we invest very globally, we invest across Europe, across Asia and all around emerging markets here in the US and um, obviously in Canada with many of our partners like the Toronto Foundation and the Equality Fund. And again, everything we're doing with the investments that they have generated is putting it back into the economy, putting it back into communities, but specifically within these themes that have just been exacerbated because of COVID. And we see a real need for more investment and really measuring what the outcome of those investments are. So for example, we invested in a ed tech fund. So we are invested in a variety of companies that are really trying to bring students in the middle of Africa that have no access to any sort of robust education system. They can now go online because the one thing that everyone has is a mobile phone. They can go online and they can access an education and a quality of an education that anyone in Canada is accessing. So those types of investments are what we're looking for. And quite frankly, we think that this is the best place to generate return over the next 10, 15 years because it's what the economy needs to grow as well. So that when, when you're talking about measuring the impacts of the investment, you're not talking simply about a financial return for your company. You're talking about the social impact that, that these investments have. Yes, and we're measuring things like how many seats for that education fund have we been able to um, create, right? We're looking at affordable housing and saying, what is the affordability metrics of that community and how is this housing um, development going to improve that? We're looking at healthcare and we're saying, how can we help those that are in the older demographic have more access to an easy way to access their insurance, their Medicare, um, all of the different, you know, complicated areas around healthcare. How can they increase that? So we're really looking in terms of measurement and impact at the very specifics that each investment is trying to generate. And of course, it's not perfect. It's not easy. Measurement and impact is outcomes are probably a whole nother panel discussion. Um, but we're doing the best we can, at least, to be able to start to look at those metrics and ensure that what we're investing in is aligned with where we think that we want to be investing to, again, make that change on a more global basis. Bruno, from your perspective, what do we need to do to build in greater resiliency, both globally and, and uh, within your country? And what can your company do to make a contribution? Well, first I would like to, to thank you for being here, and I take uh, social distancing seriously because I'm in Belgium, so far away from Canada. Um, let me put it this way, if I take a global perspective, I think that the pandemic has raised uh, two very important issues. The first one is that, and you may know that in Europe we have the so-called welfare state or social state, and basically our economies had to make a trade-off between the economy and healthcare. And most citizens were expecting more healthcare services, but at the same time, the economy needs to, to, go, to go farther. So the trade-off was difficult to find. And even today, there are big debates in most European countries about this, this trade-off. The second thing is that um, most European countries have realized that there was a deficit of public investments. And this is very important because this deficit started almost 40 years ago, uh, and especially uh, it got increased when we entered into the euro uh, 25 years ago. And let me explain this to you. Um, the, when the euro got introduced, the idea was that uh, there would be no inflation in Europe and that public uh, deficit would be decreased down to zero, that public debt should be decreased. And most European countries facing at the same time the need for public investments and the aging of population that led to more social expenses decided to cut public investments. So today, after the pandemic, we realize that we need to reinvest into the economy. And that's a big debate because it will change the frame of Europe, it will change the shape of the euro, 
Uh, and typically, Europe will have to make more and more public investment, especially in the climate change area. For my company, it changed a lot. I was a CEO when the pandemic started, and we are one of the most important players of Belgium. So we uh, are used by the government to discriminate investments, and definitely we will support the government and all, I would say, uh, uh, active investors to go for the climate change and help the, the energetic uh, transition. Now, you've had experience in both the public and the private sector. Could you just elaborate for a second on the, on the relative roles of government versus the private sector in achieving these goals? I think that um, the government will have a very important role to play because the ways of the government in the global economy, global European economy, exceeds 50% of the GDP. So nothing can be done without the support of governments. So, um, and, 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 and we know that we are hit by public debt. The public debt is being used today to stimulate the economy. So I think that the, the first energy will come from governments, and the second stage, the private sector will help. But I think that most European countries will rely on the public sector. Russia, what's your take on this? So, what are the challenges, both uh, in the national and, and global economies, and what can your company do to make a contribution? Yeah, thank you very, very much for you know including me today on the panel, and uh, thank you very much for the thoughtful question. You know, I think that we lived through a period of. Uh, unprecedented uh, disruption and unprecedented acceleration on so many axes uh, that were you know still trying as private and public sectors to, uh, to to digest and to internalize and to actually operationalize you know if I can uh, use uh, you know company jargon you know, I think one, you know, taking, going back to March 21, when COVID hit and we thought we we're going to go away for a week or two weeks and everything's going to go back to normal. There was massive disruption. There was massive disruption for the economy in general, but let's take, you know, at the, the human level. So employees that now, uh, workers, you know, being at home, small businesses closing shop, not being able to reach their consumers again, um, and, and therefore, you know, be able to continue to survive. Uh, the, the the companies and their ecosystems, i.e., you know, and their employees and, and their you know their economic viability, the ones that that uh, fared the best were the ones that was that were the most digitized, uh, the ones that were able to you know, very quickly shift in terms of offering their goods and services to offering them online instead of, or in addition to, or alongside offering them physically and in person. And, you know, those that were able to, basically without missing a beat, shift to working from home uh, with their entire employee base uh, just lit literally overnight. You know, we at Brim, being a digital first company in, in fintech, you know, our DNA, we were fortunate um, that, you know, after this, that March 21st, we didn't miss a beat in terms of uh, carrying on you know, the mission of BRIM and the work of BRIM, and we actually increased the size of the team. And there was a lot more, uh, you know, acceleration in those digitization trends, whether it is, you know, from banks or credit unions or, you know, large merchants, etc., to bring them to the fore. And now, not to bring them to the fore in two or three years or five years, but, but bring them on tomorrow. So it was, uh, you know, a very good intersection, if you will, of the, the ecosystem that Brim has built and the platform that we delivered online. And interestingly for us, uh, 2020 and 2021 were periods of unprecedented growth. And all of the implementations that we did, we didn't even have to go travel for a pitch 
you know, actually meet our customers physically, shake hands with them in order to be able to roll out full platforms within their digital banking ecosystem, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, in branches as the branches started to reopen with branch portals in order to bridge completely the digital offering and the, the, the physical offering in one, etc. cetera. Um, but, you know, I want to go back to, you know, just, just, you know, at a much higher level. So very important was to be able to transcend really that, you know, that divide between the physical and the digital seamlessly, whether it was in the delivery of goods and services or whether it was in being able to, you know, produce them as, as, as a company. Um, you know, another thing that, that we saw was small business um, that, that really, uh, you know, had to, to close down and that interface that relied heavily on the physical interface uh, disappeared. So, you know, another thing that, we, you know, where, where Brim, uh, you know, got to, to really be uniquely differentiated and, and, you know, we're very happy to have been able to help an unprecedented number of merchants literally in three minutes be able to launch offers and, and, and reach audiences that are you, the, basically the customers of all banks, various financial institutions, various large merchants that, that are our uh, partners in order to be able to, uh, to, to sell their goods and services online and be able to, you know, direct traffic, direct awareness and direct actually economic traffic to them and be able to uh, you know, sort of level the playing field uh, versus, you know, the Amazons of the world or, you know, the, the large uh, e-shopping and e-commerce platform. So, you know, we believe that the merging of financial services delivery, uh, you know, together with goods and services and commerce all merged in one, you know, really the, the, the re, the, the, the re, uh, imagination, re recreation of what is uh, finance and banking and deliver it in a seamless embedded way, uh, you know, and end-to-end -end digitized, uh, surely was, uh, was something that we felt, you know, Brim was able to contribute to the moment. Now, at the beginning of your remarks, you commented on the fact that none of us anticipated what we've been forced to live through for the last 20 months or so. Were you surprised by the degree of resiliency that there was in the system? Uh, I was worried at the outset that we would see supply chains collapse. We're seeing strain on, on supply chains now, but they functioned remarkably well during, during the pandemic. Uh, our telecom system, if we had the telecom system that had been in place at the time of SARS, it would likely have collapsed. Uh, our financial system seemed to function well as well. Were you surprised by the resiliency already built into the system? And can you identify uh, areas where there are weaknesses that we have to address? For sure, yes, thank you. You know, I, I believe in the resiliency of, of humans. And, and human beings and our societies. Uh, you know, let's just go back to the financial crisis, you know, and there I, I was uh, at Merrill Lynch Bank of America, you know, front row seat in that. And, you know, everyone was calling for doomsday collapse. Uh, you know, I, I think I fundamentally believe uh, in the strength of human beings and their will to survive and our therefore communities will to survive and governments and nations will to survive you know i think is a testament to the strength of humanity so you know with that i think this is where the public and the private ecosystems working well together would produce you know better outcomes for everyone so for example the you know the, the acceleration of the future of work. The future of work is here today. You know, it's remote work every day in a way we wouldn't have even conceived of, uh, you know, even, a, you know, a couple of years ago. Uh, whereas it's not about facilitating remote work, it's about being digital first, 
with an option to be in the office. This is for, for you know, of course, I'm talking about, uh, you know, uh, sectors of the economy uh, that are lucky enough to be able to deliver those services remotely, but that is still a very large sector of the economy. So thinking about it there, so for example, let's take it down to Ontario. We used to think that we have public policies in Ontario where we are supporting this ecosystem and making Ontario a very attractive place to attract talent. And therefore, we are supporting our Canadian companies and startups and etc. to rise and to be competitive globally. Okay, post-COVID, uh, there are no more borders. We are delivering our services and platforms and etc., and rolling them out globally in a way that that is unprecedented because you know no one now is asking us whether large banks in the UK or in Europe or in the US do you have an office in the US? The question is: Is your platform live globally? Is your platform delivered? And the answer is yes. And therefore, that gives us a massive advantage in terms of much faster globalization than would have been able to be achieved pre-COVID. Now, let's go back to that question of talent. We need to attract talent to Brim Financial, that is a Canadian, uh, you know, based company at the source of it, but really that is a global footprint uh, company. So what are the global policies that are required in order to enable us to do that better and faster than any other company that we are you know competing against globally in that digital world because right now we're able to we can you know everyone's doing remote work really hire anywhere where you know talent is available and has access uh, to work with us over the internet uh, but what are the advantages that we're going to be able to you know, by virtue of, uh, you know, where we're incorporated, for example, uh, you know, have differentiation versus uh, versus other companies that could be incorporated in other geographies. Um, you know, and I want to take, uh, you know, a moment to, to talk about, you know, how much this crisis ha had an impact on women massively based on, you know, a report from the United Nations um, and the brunt of the, the domestic, you know, chores and, you know, housework and family work, as well as, you know, the work from home and work remotely that fell onto them in droves, they left the workforce. So, you know, I think this is, again, in order to build resiliency, this is 50% of our workforce. In order to build resiliency, you know, public policies that support uh, women specifically or families in general because in general you know the chores uh, within a family construct fall, fall onto women like early child rearing or you know taking care of the elderly uh, so for example on early child rearing we're talking about you know having in canada discussion around um, funding uh, you know, nurseries and early education, not from age six onward, because what's the magic with age six onward, but from age zero onwards, which means that now all of this workforce that is at home has the, the, the bandwidth and the support of being able to continue to, to uh, you know, to deliver at an extremely high level and actually have then therefore salaries and be a productive, uh, you know, uh, entity in our economy as well as be a strong consumer and support uh, and support uh, demand effectively that supports our economy but this is where you know two things you know in the global war on talent and in supporting uh, half of the workforce working from home with better public policies you know i think we you know it's bringing to the fore let's think not incrementally but completely a shift onto these new realities and and how can we be competitive as you know canadian based companies on the global stage now each of you in your comments has has referred to the social impacts of, uh, of all of this. And I want to look at that through a, uh, through a uh, financial lens. To what extent has the pandemic changed the market's approaches and to ESGs? We're hearing a great deal more about them. Uh, obviously, the social impacts of, uh, of policies that we put in place and of structures, business activities are, are profound and the challenges are growing. Uh, to what extent has the pandemic affected that? And how is this changing? 
Bruno, do you want to start? Yes, um, you know, I, I would totally agree with uh, what had been said by uh, Rasha. I think that uh, economies have shown resilience and also the ability to overcome uh, very important and holistic issues. And, and to some extent, I would relate the pandemic with uh, ESG because the pandemic was the proof that the global economy could overcome something that was totally unexpected and, ve and a very serious issue. So what you are seeing today in Europe is that uh, ESG become number one of the concerns of most companies. And I would go even farther than that. The pandemic has shown that there was a huge difference between companies that were able to digitize their operations 10 years ago and the one that could not do that. And today the gap, you know, is so huge that uh, it's, it's almost unthinkable for the, for the companies who did not uh, decide their, their operations to overcome their delay. The same will be true for ESG in the coming 10 years. So the companies who will make today the decision to go for ESG discipline will, will be the winner of tomorrow. And, and of course, the result will be there maybe five to 10 years down the road. But this is as important as having understood 10 years before, 10 years ago, the importance of digitization. I just comment on ESG. Um, we've been investing in ESG investments, whether they're in the public markets, um, companies, uh, private markets since uh, you know 2000, since Rock Creek was started, and we have invested and put to to work almost over seven billion in ESG and impact investments, and over six billion in diverse founders. Because one of the things that's getting a little bit lost is the S in ESG, and the intersectionality between environment and social is huge. And that's being, I think, you know, it's great that we're having all these discussions around climate, around environment. We're seeing at COP26 all of these big pledges, all of these big initiatives by businesses. But I think we really have to get realistic in terms of what does that actually mean? What are financial firms, for example, that have pledged? How can they reduce their carbon footprint? But also, how can they create an inclusive environment? So to Rasha's point, more women are, are there. There's a more diverse population. All of that will really try and reduce this widening inequality gap that honestly COVID has just exacerbated. While it's been great that so many people have been able to work from home, if you think about it, we've actually got kind of a divided economy now because now you have a segment of the um, economy that can never work from home and you have a segment that only wants to stay from home. And that's actually producing across every country that we know of huge labor shortages in critical areas to have a resilient economy. There was a jobs report that said the percentage of clicks for jobs in healthcare and childcare and education were down 40%. And the clicks in terms of interest in jobs in marketing, communications, civil engineering were up 40%. Well, that's not sustainable if we want to grow this economy. We need both parts of that economy to be working. And so I think the S in ESG is critical. We've invested quite a bit in diverse founders, women founders, black and brown indigenous founders in, of companies, and yet there is still a lack of capital. Um, you know, I, I would love to be positive and say that COVID had accelerated the amount of capital going towards these areas. I think it highlighted the need for more capital and it has highlighted attention to all of these areas. I don't think we have seen enough meaningful investment and capital in these areas though. We invest one portfolio through an entire 100% gender lens. I mean, every investment, whether it's in a company, whether it's in a venture fund, whether it's in a public equity fund is um, taking into account the effect on uh, you know, closing a gender gap that they see in, within their strategy. And yet there's not a lot of other investors doing what we're doing, right? Like where is the capital behind us? And so I think one of the things that we all have to do is really figure out what are tangible steps to encourage more investment in these areas, because otherwise I think that you will have a resilient economy that goes the other way. So in your opinion, we're still wasting an enormous amount of human potential. Yes, exactly. It, you can hear there's a resonance in this room uh, to your <laughs> comment on that. Um, Russia, can I get your take on ESGs and what your company can do here? You know, I, 
I, I think, you know, small steps lead to uh, big results. So I think we, for example, uh, proved to ourselves, all of us, that we can do very effectively business remotely uh, and therefore flying across the globe for a meeting between three and five is no longer required. And if we all do that, I used to be on an airplane, you know, to New York, Monday, Tuesday, and then the rest of the geography is Thursday and Friday, you know, with only Wednesday and being in the, uh, you know, in the office actually in Toronto. So uh, we know, we proved it to ourselves that this is not required. So it's, you know, super effective from a cost perspective. We took all of this, you know, cost efficiencies and we put them more in um, supporting our employees and the quality of life of our employees from home. Um, and, you know, so it's, it's two folds, you know, so now you are providing, you know, a, you know, much more well-knitted communities that, that is connected, albeit all remotely um, and we're we're saving a little bit uh, of all of this uh, carbon on um, on on airplane trips and, and and long flights that are not required so this is on the small scale on the uh, you know on the gender scale uh, i think these are fundamental uh, these are fundamental uh, shifts uh, that need to be uh, you know, th that need to come to the fore and crystallize. Um, and, you know, very much appreciate that there's a lot of focus on it. Um, but, you know, in reality, in practice, uh, I think, uh, you know, for example, BRIM, this, so this is, you know, I always t try to t take a look at the positive impact. Uh, we need to be 10 times at least better than a male run company in order to get the same uh, you know, time of day, the same uh, attention, awareness, uh, partnerships, and, you know, and then capital, because then capital is following in this instance, after we have to, you know, prove it many times over. The great thing about BRIP is that it forced us to indeed be way better than any other fintech that we compete with globally. And as a result, we're being able to have such tremendous acceleration over 2021 in an, you know, in, in a way that we have not uh, we have not expected and it has uh, really accelerated our business um, but it's an ex post versus ex ante uh, you know support for you know diverse businesses if if you know this is what we're going to call it um, you know comes ex post you know sort of show me the money show me the results first not the let's give you the benefit of the doubt and you know and and it doesn't matter where you have where you have teams that have the grit and the resilience to say, look, we're going to do it and be 10 times better. And then everything else will, will, will follow, you know, which is, which is, you know, Brim's uh, uh, situation. However, I think that that, you know, is a fundamental inequality in approach. Uh, and, uh, you know, and, and that, that I think continues. Now, the COP conference in, in Glasgow has brought our attention, if we'd allowed it to, to wander in any way, it's brought our attention back to the fact that we are faced with an existential issue in climate change. And this is going to require, obviously, concerted action by governments, but also by individual players within the system. And increasingly, investors and, and the financial sector have a key role to play in helping to bring us to a lower carbon economy. Can I start with you, Alifia, and ask you what your company is doing and what the sector can do to assist in this transition? I think it's a great question, and there are small things and big things that you can do, right? Um, probably six, seven years ago, we got rid of all the plastic in our office, and we only have glass. Sounds like a small thing, but it's an impact, right? And you have to think about these small changes, because I think that what gets lost, again, is so many people have signed on to these pledges, but how are they going to actually reduce their carbon footprint? The planes are a great, you know, example. Measuring how much hybrid work has changed your carbon footprint. Being smart about the use of paper, right? Given that everything is digital. I mean, there are so many ways. I think um, the question is how do we measure it so that companies know the progress that they are making? And then on a bigger scale, there is still large, massive amounts of money that need to be put into technologies that will help us reduce our carbon footprint. And I think those technologies are developing. We've invested in things like Generate, which is a sustainable infrastructure um, 
fund, which is amazing in terms of the number of different areas and technologies it's investing in and supporting in. Um, but there is so much more that needs to be done in terms of that investment and in terms of actually uh, encouraging companies to invest in those new technologies. I think um, that is one thing that is also overlooked. You know, we talk about divestment and there's that whole old age um, you know, conflict of do you divest or do you encourage a company to invest in these new technologies? I think you have to do both. I don't see how we can um, really get to the pledges that governments and companies and individuals have made last week, last year. I don't know how you actually get to meaningful change if you don't start to look at how companies, both bad companies and good companies, can really start to invest in those new technologies that are needed to allow individuals to really reduce their carbon footprint and make a change. And I think that the big thing is also, how does that impact individuals in those communities, right? So we talked about deforestation. That was a big theme that came out of COP26. Well, you have to think then about the farmers, about the communities. What is their livelihood going to be if they can't sell the trees? I mean, there's a whole chain of different impacts that have to be looked at. And I think it's great that so much money has gone towards this, but I think we really need to be able to make sure that we can measure what that money is producing to make sure that we're making the right investments. Thanks, Olivia. Bruno, what can both the financial sector and, and your company do? Well, the financial sector can do a lot. And uh, what I expect uh, to happen in the coming years is that banks will be used by governments to promote uh, the COP26 and all the decisions that are being made today. Uh, and let me give you some examples. Uh, we see today uh, in Belgium, but in some European countries, that the equity charge that will be associated uh, to mortgage loans or to some credits will be increased depending on the carbon footprint. So it will force uh, financial, the financial sector to contribute indirectly to uh, the cleanup of the economy. Uh, second thing that we are doing at my company, we are promoting private equity investments in the climate transition. And it's very important because it means that it's a proof that uh, you know, multiple initiatives and capital can be collected uh, into this kind of transition. So definitely, we expect the financial sector to be used by governments. And, you know, for the, and that would be a wise decision because uh, the parallel was made with the crisis of 08 by uh, one of the two speakers. And we, we are facing exactly the same story. We have a, a major impact in front of us. And the financial sector, which is the heart of the economy, has to play a role in the transition. Thank you. Russia? Yes, I, I definitely agree with Mr. Paul Mons, uh, uh, remarks there. Uh, you know, I think uh, I think the financial sector, you can think about it as the maestro of an orchestra uh, where it, it uh, directs investments and where it puts charge and where it puts, you know, requirement minimum yields and returns is uh, where you're going to see impact. Great example about, you know, uh, a charge on mortgages because, you know, then the construction company is going to wa want to make this building, you know, more uh, carbon friendly in order to have it be more competitive for consumers to, to buy it there, so and so on and so forth. I definitely believe that, you know, financial uh, metrics and financial institutions and the financial system is the maestro of the economy. Um, you know, and uh, the, you know, from, from a, uh, you know, from, from a micro perspective, I think the digitization goes a, a very long way. Like, for example, you know, a, a very simple change of having the default be everything's going to be virtual, your statements, everything's going to be virtual. Um, it means that we're not going to we're not going to print and we're not going to ship and we're not going to send out those statements and, you know, so on and so forth, you know, going down the chain in, in carbon footprint, um, you know, uh, merchants uh, where we're going to be able to, con you know, immediately deliver um, their goods and services to the public right where the public is actually making financial transactions and where 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 they're getting their their mortgage and their you know and their deposit account and all of this we are actually uh, meshing it if you will with uh, with rewards and merchant and and social commerce into banking uh, 
and and brim really is very much at the intersection of that uh, you know and from from my perspective it's it's extremely efficient for for those merchants and that increases the resilience of the economy instead of having it being uh, you know very very uh, uh, concentrated in terms of few large merchants now you go back to being able to have it distributed which is which is which is what how it becomes more resilient and and from from a carbon footprint now that they have so much visibility and you know and direct uh, you know consumer effectively uh, delivery without necessarily going to the various stores just think of of you know from from a logistics perspective not having these goods and services dispatched to point a to then being sold sold and dispatched to point b so we're going directly from the source and right in time and you know and and, and basically as a straight line instead of having a point along the way in terms of logistics, which which is carbon footprint, there's a, a lot of you know various axes of optimization that is happening uh, through digitization and and through merging and removing the walls, uh, whether they be about talent, about gender, about commerce, about commerce and finance and banking, uh, you know, and, and I think you know, we're going into hopefully building. Uh, a new, better word, more re resilient, but building better, hopefully. Time, unfortunately, is fast running out. Time for one very quick uh, question to the three of you. Um, the obvious question is, where do we go from here? We don't know what the next crisis is going to be. It could be another pandemic that makes, uh, that makes us wistful for COVID. It could be a climate change emergency. It could be terrorism or cyber terrorism. Yet resiliency is the common thread that runs through any response that we have. Can each of you give just one suggestion for what should be the priority for government and business in preparing resiliency for whatever the next crisis is? Bruno? Well, um, with my European perspective, I would say that the next crisis I expect to happen would be a social crisis because the pandemic has revealed inequalities uh, has revealed the need for government help and we are facing at the same time a health crisis and an economic crisis so hopefully uh, our governments will be wise enough to to overcome this social crisis if you have seen two years ago the yellow vests or jackets whatever you call them in france uh, it, it, it could happen again so this is my main concern for the coming for the coming quarters Alifia? Sure. I would say that I think governments and businesses need to look at three things to be able to um, ensure that they are prepared for any sort of crisis, because we, to your point, won't know what shape or form that crisis comes in. So I think, you know, both businesses and governments need to look at every investment that they're making in the economy from a risk perspective, a return perspective and an impact perspective. And there's no trade off across the three. And they need to look at it with that mindset. And that should be what the framework is for every decision, every system that they put in place, any investment that they're making, whether you're a government or you're a company. And hopefully that then better prepares us for the next crisis. Thank you. And Russia, a quick response. Yeah, I very much agree with Alifia on the three axes and the, you know, the, the need to look at them, uh, each one of them. Um, I, I think, you know, a, a, a much closer, uh, wide, uh, cooperation between uh, public and private uh, sectors, as well as, you know, the emerging companies, uh, you know, for example, like ourselves, together with government in order to make sure that we are weaving into policy all the various experiences and perspective and lenses and, and really bringing in what we've learned uh, today very quickly and incorporating it into public policies because public policies have a very real impact. You know, as I said, as Monsieur Colbon said just, just before, you know, governments have the most tremendous impact, you know, on, on how economies move forward. Well, what a great panel. Thank you very much to the three of you. Each of you have brought an important perspective, broad experience, and, and a very creative approach to dealing with this issue. It's one that's going to be with us for a long time yet to come, and we greatly appreciate your participation. Ladies and gentlemen, will you join me in a round of applause for the panel? <laughs>